an island paradise in the Pacific Ocean, but now at the center of a strategic game of diplomatic chess. This isn't a common description for the Solomon Islands, but since it established diplomatic ties with China last month, the US and Taiwan have sat up and taken notice. At the center of it all is the small island of Tulagi, an island with only about 1,200 inhabitants. It has now been leased to a Chinese company as part of a, quote, strategic cooperation agreement. The company intends to develop a refinery on the island, but its potential use as a military base has experts worried. It's worth remembering this deal came about after the Solomon Islands broke off diplomatic ties with Taiwan. The diplomatic loss was strategic gain for China, which now has an island in waters that have traditionally been under the US sphere of influence. Listen to what the foreign minister of Taiwan said about this recently. From the long-term strategic perspective, like-minded friends and partners should really be worried whether the Pacific will remain free and open and whether the key actors follow the rules-based international order. Developments in the South China Sea in the last decade or so served as a very good lesson for all of us. I certainly don't want to see the Pacific turn into another South China Sea with us one day or signing that it is too late for us to do anything. So what does he mean? We need to take a look at two maps to understand this. And to explain that, Ola Alsakar is with me in the studio to help us make more sense of this. Ola, welcome. What is the connection between the South China Sea and the Pacific? Hi, Birash. Uh, let's first take a look at this map of the South China Sea. The red line that you can see here is no what is known as the Nine Dash Line. That is the demarcation line for China's unilateral claim to these waters. If you look at the blue dots, that those are the um, uh, those are the territorial claims of the other countries in the region. Now, China claims it has an historic claim to these waters. The UN says there is no legal basis for such a claim, but that doesn't seem to bother China. There is an economic side to this. Uh, these waters are rich uh, fisheries water. There is also potential oil and gas reserves here, but this really comes down to military dominance. Now, there are islands scattered across this area. Some of them are just shoals or tiny coral outcrops. That was until Beijing started developing them, forming them into solid land and building harbors and military installations there. So what is the connection between this situation and the Pacific? So the Taiwanese foreign minister that we just heard there, he says that China will do to the Pacific what they have already done to the South China Sea. If you look at this map, this is Tulagi. If China gets a military presence here, that is significant. Firstly, there is a strategic significance. We have Australia right down here. Uh, the strait between Australia and Papua New Guinea is a major shipping route. Uh, but there are also a military significance to this. Tulagi was once the capital of the British protectorate of the Solomon Islands. It was taken by the Japanese during the Second World War. It was rewon by the Americans during the famous uh, Battle of Guadalcanal. So these islands have always had a link to, to the West for the last 60 years. And this is what it really comes down to. Uh, Beijing is challenging Washington's status in, in the Pacific Ocean. Now, Washington already have military installations in strategic waters belonging to other countries in this area. And now it seems Beijing is doing the same. Well, Al Sakar, thanks very much for coming in and breaking that down on the maps for us. Now, the other side of the story is, of course, that all of this has come at the cost of Taiwan and its ties with other countries. The United Nations recognizes only Beijing as the government of China and not Taiwan. This means only a handful of countries have official diplomatic ties with Taiwan. At the moment, that list is incredibly short. Only 15 countries, including Vatican City, recognize Taiwan as a country. Since 2016, Taiwan has lost five allies to China, the most recent ones being, you saw them there, the Pacific nations of Kiribati and the Solomon Islands. Here's what the Prime Minister of the Solomon Islands said on his first state visit to China after his country established diplomatic relations with it. So my government and, and people have chosen to be on the right side of history and normalize relationship with the People's Republic of China. 
The Prime Minister of the Solomon Islands there. With me in the studio for more is Taiwan's representative to Germany, Xie Jiwei. Mr. Xie, thanks so much for being with us. You heard the Prime Minister of the Solomon Islands there. Has the Solomon Islands chosen to be on the right side of history? Well, I, I think I won't blame him for his choice because they may have their points why they switch over from Taiwan to China. But what, what I want to say is uh, these islands, which has been leased to a Chinese company with very close ties to the, to the Chinese uh, communist regime, is called Tulagi. I think they won't be too lucky if we wait a little bit more because China is buying all these habits, not only this Tulagi, we know Djibouti, we know uh, Guada, we know uh, Abu Dhabi, and so on and so on. China is expanding their maritime power. And since this country is not a democratic one, so you cannot expect too much from them because they are doing something not only for commercial, but also especially for military. Uh, it's interesting, the, the play of words that you used over there, it, they, they, they won't be too lucky. There's a play of words that the foreign ministry uh, of Taiwan is also using. It's calling it uh, dollar diplomacy. And in this particular instance, it said, I quote, false promises of large amounts of foreign assistance <laughs> on the part of China. So basically what the foreign ministry of Taiwan is saying is that China is lying. Well, that's, that, that's, put, that's put in this way. Uh, I used to say, if China is a free country, is a democratic one, there won't be no problem. They can buy 20 or 30 harbors everywhere. The problem is just take a look at, at what is happening now in Hong Kong. And in the last four decades, they've been trying to threaten Taiwan. Not only that, you know, you, must, you people must have heard about this Indo-Pacific Indo Strategic uh, uh, Alliance. It's supposed to be under Greta Kramp Karrenbauer. And all about less strategies or about less business. What they are doing is to expand their power. And not only Taiwan is threatened, all the countries like, like Philippines, like Vietnam, like Australia. And that's, and and so that's going back to the South China Sea that we were yeah. just talking about. But just to go back to a point that you were making, you said that if China was a democratic country, and if I look at what you're saying now, you almost seem to be saying that if China was a democratic country, this sort of expansion of power would be okay? No, in this case, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have used the word expansion. I would just say they are trying to, uh, to engross the business area of China and everyone could really get some profit from that. And in the case, as what has already happened, it's, it's not the case because the real, the real purpose is to get what they want and not to share with the people what they can share. All right. Uh, let's look at the timing of these moves. Taiwan is headed towards a presidential election yes. in January next year. Do you 11th think, January, yeah. Do you think what China is doing has something to do with the elections in Taiwan? Sure. It's not only what they are trying to do. They have done already since the 19, 1996 when, Taiwan, uh, when Taiwan, Taiwanese people tried to elect our president directly. And... They have some favorite in the, I, w I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say which party, but they have their own favorite. And our president, Chai Ing-wen, has been so brave to say, no, we won't accept one country, two systems. We won't accept the so-called 2092 uh, consensus. Let's we just, are democratic. Let, I need to ask you uh, questions on that. Let's just listen to what your president um, had to say uh, at the uh, October 10th National Day celebrations. And then we'll come back and continue talking to the representative here. The overwhelming consensus among Taiwan's 23 million people is our rejection of one country, two systems regardless of party affiliation or political position. Uh, one country, two systems will never be accepted in Taiwan. And you were, you were talking about that. Is that not a provocative statement uh, coming from uh, the head of Taiwan? Well, I would say because Taiwan has suffered under martial law from 1949 to 1987, we know the difference between free, freiheit, freedom, and dictatorship. So we, we have so much, so a high uh, uh, respect with what we have received. Speech of freedom, speech of the region, and so on. 
and Hong Kong, China, Tibet, they don't have it. That means one country system, because when Hong Kong was given over from the UK to China, right. the, former, the former president of China said, just look over here, Taiwanese people, what happens to Hong Kong will be the next future of Taiwan. That was a promise. And after 22 years, the Hong Kong people say the same thing to us. Right. Today, Hong Kong, tomorrow, Taiwan, but not as a promise, but as a warning. In, in terms of promise, what about the consensus of 1992 in which Taipei and Beijing basically agreed that there was going to be one China? Is that no longer relevant? I would, I would like to point out this 92 sentence. The, the, the consensus of 92 was achieved between the Chiang Kai-shek's party and the Communist Party. And that means the Taiwanese people has, no, has not the obligation to get into the step of what once Chiang Kai-shek and his party wanted, namely to say, we owe, we owe the whole China, the mainland. We don't do that. The Taiwanese people wanted to, wanted to say to the world, we are, we are a democratic and we want to govern us in the sovereign state. So just to be clear, what you're saying is that Taiwan now rejects the consensus of 1992? Yes. Well, I would say, I have to say it in another way. There has never been a 92 consensus. It was an agree to disagree between, as I would like to point out, between Chiang Kai-shek's right. party and Communist Party. Okay. The voice of the Taiwanese people is we are a China, we are, we are a Taiwan, we are a sovereign state. Right. We'll have to leave it there for the timing, but thanks so much for coming in, Representative Ji Wei Xie. You're welcome.